Um, well, ladies and lady and gentlemen, again, my name is John Paris. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. Um, well, what we're going to do uh, to start, we'll start with Ellen. If you could please introduce yourself. Uh, we have four Democrats on, on the board right now. Please introduce yourself, uh, the race for which you're running, and briefly summarize why you've decided to run for this particular race at this particular time. Okay, so my name is Ellen Spiegel. I currently represent Assembly District 20, which starts at the Galleria Mall in Henderson and goes kind of on the diagonal up to Flamingo in Maryland. I am running for re-election, and the bottom line is that Nevada needs a lot of help. We need to turn things around. We've been making some good progress, but we have to continue to work on our education system, on our healthcare system, on economic development, there's on our housing um, situation. There are a number of issues that need help, and I've got experience, interest, and passion for the community. I want to make a difference, so I'm ready for real Steve. Steve Yeager, running for Assembly District 9 in the southwest part of the valley. If you think Siena, Roach Ranch, Wet and Wild, um, that's the area that we're talking about. It's an open seat this time around, and I'm running because I think this is a very exciting time for Nevada. We're finally starting to pull out of the recession, and we have a chance to make sure we have good policy going forward. Um, and I want to be part of those discussions and part of those conversations and represent the folks in Assembly District 9, and I'm looking forward to it. And, I will guarantee you one thing, that I will work harder than anybody to make sure that uh, the folks in Assembly District 9 are taken care of. Good. Elliot. El Elliot Anderson running for re-election to Assembly District 15. Running for re-election because there's still so many things that uh, I want to do that I haven't been able to. I want to push uh, better education policy. I want to fundamentally change the way that Nevada does government to bring this into being more of a 21st century state rather than a state that hasn't changed its government in, in a lot of ways since we were first founded. Those are the biggest things that are on my mind and why I'm you know, calling, uh, asking for another shot. Okay. I'm Justin. Thanks, John, and uh, thank you for taking me out of order today. Uh, so <laughs> to knock some doors this morning. Uh, I was elected in 2012, it was a special election. Uh, my daughter, uh, who at the time was seven years old, had uh, struggled in our schools. I'd seen the schools in my area of town, which is the far southwest, uh, Steve's area, but also uh, Mountain's Edge, Rhodes Ranch, um, and uh, Southern Highlands. I'd seen the schools out there uh, continue to burst at the seams, and I decided that uh, you know, my parents taught me that if you're going to complain, then you better be ready to do something about it. And so I decided to step up to the plate and uh, roll up my sleeves to, to try and help the situation. Uh, we were able to get uh, $498 million in additional funds for our schools here in Southern Nevada, working with my colleagues here, um, which was uh, a great step forward. We were able to get $50 million to our Zoom schools for English language learner programs uh, for the first time ever. Uh, but we've got a lot of work to do. And uh, we've got to, to fix the issue with school construction. Um, it's at the top of my priority list. I know it's at the top of the priority list of, of my colleagues in the assembly. So that's why I'm running for re-election, because we've got a lot of work to do. Okay. Um, you know, but, 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 almost everyone brought up education. Um, but that's just way too easy of a topic, I think. Um, <laughs> plus, we've heard a lot about it today. Um, but one thing that we haven't heard about um, uh, somewhat uh, some of a curveball, I guess, and we'll start with Justin and go down the line. In the last few years, civil rights issues have come back to the forefront. We've heard, you know, we have you know, DOMA legislation, we had the recent Arizona laws that ultimately were vetoed, and then we had the shooting in Ferguson County approximately a month and a half ago. But what ideas do you have to perhaps proactively try and address those situations uh, to try and minimize the, the civil strife that occurs uh, uh, anytime those types of um, well, those types of issues do arise, I think civil rights issues are, are key, and I think we we made some great strides in the last legislative session. Uh, SGR 13 uh, put our state on on the, the track in order to repeal the constitutional uh, prohibition on marriage uh, marriage equality. Uh, we were able to to do that. With, with broad bipartisan, well, broad, <laughs> broad support uh, with some uh, bipartisan uh, partnership on that. Um, we're also able to expand our ENDA laws here in the state of Nevada. 
to include uh, gender discrimination, uh, gender identity discrimination. And so I think those are, those are two ways in which we've already shown that we're putting ourselves on the right path when it comes to civil rights issues. Tom, that is an important question. Um, and I always believed uh, since I was uh, a kid, before I even joined the Marine Corps, that the promise of America is freedom. Justin's already touched on one of those issues, um, you know, freedom the Mary who, whom we love. Um, but you know what we also need to be uh, cognizant about is that the government shouldn't be treating citizens as the enemy. Um, the government, we shouldn't be worried and fearful of our own government. I, like you saw uh, those scenes in Ferguson, and was a little disturbed. Um, one of the bills that I'm working on, um, other, some of my other colleagues are working on, uh, privacy um, from UAS commonly referring to uh, as drones. Uh, we, we, can't, we have to have a government that people can trust and when they see these um, scenes on TV that's a problem because it undermines the confidence um, in all of us and it casts aspersion upon everything that we do because they look at us differently. And so to answer your question succinctly, um, civil rights is important because without trust and without confidence we can't do anything. And so uh, I'm glad that you brought that up and can promise you that um, civil rights um, is already on the forefront of my mind. Um, as a deputy public defender, you know, making sure that every Nevada is afforded the rights of the Constitution is very important to me. Um, and, and I think that's essentially what we're talking about here is making sure that our citizens, no matter what race they may be from, no matter what sexual orientation, no matter what gender, that they're treated equally under our law and treated with respect. Uh, Figuring out a way to do that can be a bit harder, but in my experience, you know, I think it's sometimes easy to be discriminatory against somebody if you just don't have any experience or know people from that particular background. In my experience, I think one way that we could hopefully make sure something like that doesn't happen here is to just make sure that our institutions are representative of the community that uh, they represent so that you know it's not, it's not a matter of us versus them, but uh, to make sure that we have adequate representation, whether it be in the police force or, or other arenas, because I do think working together, getting to know other people of different backgrounds and different mindsets is really a way that we foster respect uh, among one another. And, and I think we're moving in the right direction here in the state of Nevada. We're probably more culturally diverse, at least in southern Nevada, uh, than a lot of places are. And I think with that shared experience, hopefully we can avoid having any of those kind of um, events happen here in the state of Nevada. And Ellen. Okay, thank you. Um, taking what my colleagues have been saying and just looking at it slightly differently is that I think that in addition to working on these issues um, from this perspective, we need to start working with our children and getting kids young to understand tolerance and understand that just because someone isn't like you doesn't mean that they're not like you. And and to that end, I've actually been working with Senator Parks on an anti-bullying legislation that will both um, help the children who are being bullied, but then also get some help for the bullies themselves because they need to understand that what they're doing is wrong and why it's wrong, so just punishing them isn't enough. And we need to get help for both sets of children. And I think that if we can be teaching tolerance, and teaching people um, the, the right way to treat everybody with respect, then we'll be able to move forward and not hopefully have um, some of the same problems we're having now. Okay. Usually I ask about four questions and then I'll turn it over to the panel, but I'm going to turn it over to the panel now because I know you guys want to jump in. Mike, Ron? Kevin. Kevin? Don't prove me a liar. School. Education. Education. A short, a condensed version of education, if you'd be so kind. Yeah, I can go on and on. And on. I know, <laughs> I know. That's why we're an hour behind but schedule. Just like, just like last panel, I have shared. Okay, here's my take on it. Leaders died. Ready? Okay. Everybody say that we don't have enough money. We need more money for the education. But if we have a way that we can help solve the problem, and it is a long-term issue. And uh, that I believe we ought to do it. The uh, school that I've heard everybody said, you know, go to private school. Yeah, it costs a lot more, but it's nice. The thing is, private school used to be free. It's run by a church. 
but nowadays it's more expensive than our public school. And what's the difference is that they have Bibles. And if we were to work with a community that the worst of the area, there are churches on every four corners. And they were to come to you, our schools, to teach our young, which are in the grade school or in the kindergarten. That's where our problem really begins. If they are not educated, well, not with these uh, uh, the math sample that it take a minute and a half to figure out the whole nine yard. I have engineers that they have problem teaching their kids with math currently. So with that, as a community, church leaders, they are fully qualified. And instead of telling adults repent and donate, now they can work, do something as well to teach our young. I don't mind my son to take Bible courses. And he's seven right now. Just read it. Just read and read and read. They'll memorize. They'll become wise. That's how we used to have it. That's how, that's how we used to all of our kids or with the greats from the past. That's how they learned it. Don't have that much book, but they all become very wise. Nowadays, we have little kids all day long just with, and, and that's going to be a major, major problem for 10, 20 years to come. All they have is angry birds. And that is very violence that all of our kids are facing. So that's my two cents to share. And because you have so much, you know, you're, you're the leader of the community. And I commend that. You see the problem, you solve it. You spend a lot of time out there, election after election. And I've been seeing everybody doing it, and it's, it's a lot of time that you spend for everybody. But that's, that's where I've seen the problem is at. Because my elders, they're all graduated from college now. My young one is in the first grade. And the big difference is our youngs, if they're not taught, they bring it to you, you know, high school and whatever. Then by that time, it's way too late. So per perhaps the question then would be, uh, how do we perhaps structure uh, additional funding or additional focus on some of the younger, uh, younger school-aged children, you know, K through five or somewhere thereabouts, to try and give them the appropriate foundation, uh, such such that by the time they get to high school, you know, they they do they have something strong to build upon, rather than, as Kevin said, be addicted to Angry Birds as much fun as that game very well may be. Oh yeah. Um, but uh, I, I guess Elliot, we'll, we'll start with you and kind of migrate around. What it is you have maybe to focus on our, our, our the youth, the extreme youth, the, the K through five age youth uh, of our uh, uh, of our electorate, and, and how can we maybe focus our educational efforts towards that? Well, I think you have to start with the basics. Um, we haven't even built the schools in a lot of places to sustain them. You know, Justin has been a leader on those sort of issues and focusing on the fact that we are not keeping up with the growth that we are still experiencing. And we never really caught our breath after the last round of growth. That's the start. Um, we need to have facilities that are capable of handling all of the kids that we have to educate. And then from there, we have to make sure the classrooms uh, are kept, um, the ratio between teachers and uh, children are kept very low. That's the other uh, thing that needs to happen initially to start. We need to get kids in earlier from pre-K, um, and give them full day education, and then we need to keep those class sizes low so they can really focus on reading early. Um, we had a proposal along with some of those other proposals last session um, to do just that. Um, unfortunately, all of those, you know, sort of didn't make it, uh, but uh, it was not for lack of, uh, of trying, and we're certainly gonna try again. Um, but reading, if I had to s summarize what do kids need at that age more than anything else, they need to learn how to read. Without learning how to read, you can't understand physics, you can't understand chemistry, uh, and that's what they need to be doing at that age, hopefully, you know, by third grade. Um, so if I had to summarize it, reading. 
Do you, and, and just to dovetail, we'll give everybody a chance to answer the questions in general. Um, uh, do you think the margins tax and the increase in revenues uh, that might stem therefrom, do you think that would be the answer to, or at least a partial answer to the problem? You know, I'm not sure. Um, I, I believe in lead, follow, and get out of the way. Uh, and unfortunately, the legislature has failed um, to really lead on revenue. Um, and it's not for lack of anyone here at this table trying. It's for the fact that uh, quite structurally, it's prevented multiple legislators uh, multiple legislatures and multiple governors all the way back to Kenny Quinn. And so we have to have a real talk in Nevada about how we best um, address those needs. And at this point, I, I think, you know, my position on that is to let the people have their say because um, they haven't uh, gotten it um, for a decade or plus from the legislature. Okay, Justin, uh, uh, kids 10 years younger, education dovetailing with the margin tax. Uh, sure. Two, two points uh, with regards to uh, this education issue. My daughter went from an all-day kindergarten program, which we paid for uh, at a public school, into first grade and was mixed in with other kids who were not in an all-day kindergarten program. And as a result of that, within uh, the first two months, she had multiple red cards because she was bored out of her mind. And by the middle of the year, we ended up pulling her out of school uh, because she was at a different place than a lot of the kids in the class because she had been in an all-day kindergarten program. We have to provide all-day kindergarten to all children so that we don't have that same issue of integration at the first grade level. Second point, uh, my daughter is now at a public charter school. And uh, again, getting to the boredom issue, my daughter is very much interested in arts integrated education. And she was able to find, well, fortunately near our house, an arts integrated school uh, that allows her to focus on the issues um, and to learn in the way that is right for her. And we have to provide more opportunities for our kids, particularly at the, at the young K through five level, to learn in the way that's best for them. And I think that charter schools are part of the answer to that, uh, that problem. And regarding the margin tax, what are your feelings on that? Well, I, I think, look, I mean, I, I agree with Elliot. It's up to the voters at this point. I, I'd like an opportunity to, to try and take a stab at it. I think there's been some some, uh, some, some good uh, notions coming from the governor, some, some good notions coming from Republicans on the issue, from the business community. Uh, I, I, I think I'm an optimist that perhaps we could get something done in the next session, but it's really up to the, to the uh, voters. Ellen. Okay, um, well let's start with number two first, and number one, and I concur with what Justin and Elliot have been saying. Um, at this point, the voters do need to weigh in on it. When we're talking about education, we have made some strides. We um, put additional money in the budget during the last session to bring down classroom size a little bit. We also put money in the budget to start reworking the education formula and getting some more money for ELL programs and early education programs down here um, and getting some more funding, having the resource shift a little bit from the north down to the south. The funding so, formula. The funding formula. And the funding formula still needs more work. We absolutely need more infrastructure. This past week was, um, I spent time, there's a legislator in the schools program, and I spent time in schools in my district. Spoke to um, almost 500 students this week. One school, one elementary school, had 17 portables and needs more. And this is in Henderson. This is an established community. We can't have our elementary schools be that overcrowded. It's just not acceptable. But the other thing that I've determined from talking with kids and, and, um, and working with some of the kids in my district, I discovered that a number of children need eyeglasses and don't have them. And I, during reading week last year, I was at a school in my district, and the fourth grade teacher stopped the class to stop me in the middle of the book to tell me that over half the class needed glasses, and they were having problems passing and reading, not because they weren't bright, not because they weren't motivated, not for any other reason than they couldn't see what was on the piece of paper in front of them. So we need to be doing things like making sure that all of our kids have glasses and if they need hearing aids, have hearing aids. By the way, I was able to work with the um, Legislative Council Bureau and get Pearl Vision to donate glasses to the class. Um, but that's one class and it's a drop in the bucket and I don't want to throw our kids away because we're not helping them get glasses. Um, so we need to be doing some very pragmatic things. Angry bird. That, that can, that can, 
<laughs> That's why the glasses. But, you know, they, they have to be able to see, to read. They have to be able to hear to know what the teacher's saying. And I think that we have to look at some of the fundamental underlying issues to even take um, the teachers who are already working really hard and giving them the tools they need for success. Steve? I guess I'll start with number two as well. You know, I don't think anyone would really credibly argue to you that we've adequately funded public education, certainly not in Southern Nevada. I mean, it's a question of how, how are we going to get there? Is it, is it going to come from the voters? And, and if it does, the legislature's hands will be tied for a period of years. But um, if that proposal doesn't pass, I'm hopeful that you know, we're finally at a point as a community and as a Southern Nevada caucus that we know something has to be done to generate more revenue for education. What that looks like at the legislature remains to be seen, but you know, I certainly have some concerns about how that proposal is written, but you know, we'll see what, what the voters think in that regard. Um, going back to question number one, I concur with almost everything that was said. Um, just want to add one more point. You know, I think that we can't overlook the money that was given for English language learners and the fact that we need more. There's a perception that you know everyone who doesn't speak English in the Clark County School District speaks Spanish. That's not true. And I know that probably somebody on this panel knows the exact number, but I think the last time I heard somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 80 different languages are spoken by students at the Clark County School District. And I see that when I knock on doors because I talk to voters who do not speak English and they do not speak Spanish. I don't know which language you're speaking, but I can only imagine that being a child in a household where English is not spoken, we need to have an emphasis on that because as, as Elliot said, if, if you can't read, you're not going to achieve anything. And certainly if you don't speak the language, I don't think we can expect you to be proficient. So I would certainly like to, to advocate for additional monies and especially in Assembly District 9, I see it, we have a very diverse community. Um, and I think that's a Southern Nevada wide issue. You know, the Clark County School District here is large and has some very unique issues, but I think everyone realizes we need to make progress so that we don't end up with a generation that's very good at Angry Birds and not much else. It's going to be worse. Yeah. Yeah. So, just to introduce you, right behind you is uh, Confucius, and which uh, that had been carrying on for 2,500 years. They've been dropped for the last hundred years, and they ruined the whole country. Just to let you know. Okay. And, yes, uh, right. and the uh, as far as class-wise, what we care about is kids that's in school right now. Not just my son. He's in first grade. He'll be second grade. He's a second grader now. But this entire generation, by the time they go to high school, it's too late. There, there, there. I have I've, I've known teachers that they come from abroad to teach, say Chinese class, you know, with the homeland security. After the first year, they go, you know what? The student over here, I can deal with them. They have no respect. They have nothing. Without respect, they can't learn. 